You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I want to introduce, we have on the line with us, Howard Brown, and he is uh, the board president of the AJC in Detroit, and he attended the Presbyterian USA General Assembly as an observer to bear witness to the proceedings. Howard Brown, I want to welcome you to the Final Say Radio Show. You're on with Brett and John Rappaport, and I thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Excellent. Uh, Glad to be on, John and Brett. Thanks for having me on today. Well, Howard, if you can, if you could describe to us, one, uh, what what the AJC is and what your role is, just to give a little background so people understand that. And then, two, if you could describe what this meeting was about and the types of things which were discussed, and then we could start to address them afterward. Sure. The the AJC is um, over a hundred year old uh nonprofit NGO and stands for the American Jewish Committee. And it is a advocacy and diplomacy organization uh with worldwide offices and its uh, primary responsibility is talking to uh uh diplomats, uh consul generals, foreign ministries um, about uh Jewish issues and causes. Uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, it's a human rights organization and uh, uh, looking out for interfaith and human rights uh, violators throughout the world, and uh, terrific, terrific uh, organization doing great work. Now, Howard, you mentioned human rights, and it's very interesting because this nation has committees all through the House and the Senate that deal with issues of human rights, and we're constantly reading different things that come out with regards to things that occur all throughout the world. And to me, Israel is almost the first responder to the world. And let me give an example. Uh, in Haiti, when you had that horrific, uh, you know, where all, the, almost the entire country was devastated in the earthquake and, and all that happened there, Israel sent one of the most advanced uh, medical teams that the world knows that was able to respond so quickly and help so many people. And you're talking about such a tiny nation, which I have to say most countries just can't stand for whatever reason, but they were so willing to go and help people. And you have to ask, what did all the other countries do immediately? What did, what did they do? Because, you know, to me, Israel looks after the human rights of so many other nations regardless. They just go. They respond when people are in need. And I'll give an example. Along with the AJC, there are thousands and thousands of organizations that are supported by uh, you know, Jews and, and Jewish people who try to help people, whether it's feeding them, clothing them, housing them, educating them, and so on and so forth. Go ahead. No, I, I ab- absolutely agree. So it's, it's fascinating work. Um, so it's, uh, it's basically uh, you know, locally driven, but... Uh, internationally recognized as, as, a, as a leader in uh, the Organized Jewish Committee with, uh, you know, counterpart organizations such as the Anti-Defamation League. Um, and the um, what we do is uh, we, we, we advocate, you know, for Israel and for uh, Jewish rights. But not only do we do that is that we have specific high-level relationships with uh, Christian population and denominations, uh, the Muslim uh, world, as well as other ethnicities and um, and minority groups uh, that necessarily cannot speak for themselves. Um, the interesting thing is that the uh, the Presbyterian USA, based out of Louisville, Kentucky, had their annual general assembly, uh, their biannual general assembly here every two years, and they actually had it in Detroit this year. And um, AJC took a lead position in what I call hallway advocacy and diplomacy to uh, educate the commissioners of this uh, very large mainline church body as to uh, that divestment was not the answer, aligning themselves with the uh, BDS movement was not the answer, and not certainly going to bring, uh, you know, two bodies together for peace negotiations, you know, whatsoever, and that uh, a vote for divestment was really very much symbolic and um, and going to do more harm than good. And, and that's the fallout that we're seeing uh, in the aftermath of this conference that took place all week. I will tell you that it was, uh, as an observer, fairly frustrating to uh, sit in these planning and committee meetings 
about the Middle East. And um, here, the misinformation, uh, the, the bias rhetoric uh, presented to these groups, um, and as an observer, you're not allowed to say anything. You just have to sit back and listen. And uh, groups such as the BDS movement uh, and the Jewish Voice for Peace uh, were you know, substantially lobbying, lobbying on the other side, uh, making sure that uh, Israel was wearing its villain hat and that the Palestinians were the victims. No, that's absolutely correct. Howard, I want to offer a, a few things here. And when you look at the BDS movement, you know, they claim to be, well, let me just read their stated claims, which are, one, to create global boycotts of Israeli universities and industries, purportedly only those that do business in the occupied Palestinian territories. Two, to have nations, banks, and industries divest themselves of investment in Israeli banks, companies, and the nation as a whole. And three, to obtain international sanctions against Israel, its economy, and its people. Now, when you read all that, and then you understand what's been going on for many years, I think they're, they're being somewhat effective. Israel, of course, still exists, but they are having a greater impact than the decade after decade of terrorist attacks and the tens of thousands of Israeli citizens who have been harmed in terrorist attacks. And that's why I call this the Third Intifada, because they're changing their strategy. And unfortunately, there are so many people who are being hoodwinked in, because they hear something, and they're told lies, and they don't properly investigate, and in many cases, members of the media, unlike John and I, who do our due diligence, they don't do their work as journalists, and they just report either just because they feel a certain way or because they go with to get along. And unfortunately, Howard, I, you know, we commend you for the work that you do, by the way, but John and I have to work with you and with the AJC and so many other groups to help educate and stand up for what is right. And in this particular case, it seems that too many, again, are supporting the terrorists and those who wish to, and let me just finish with this. They don't believe in a two-state solution. They believe in one state, and that includes Israel no longer existing. That's exactly the way it appears. That's exactly the way it's been stated. And, Howard, you're well aware of this because you've been following this for so many years. Israel, numerous prime ministers have made offers that were so beyond believable to settle with the Palestinians um, at this particular issue of peace. And every single time, the Palestinians have walked away from the table. And with the amount of land and things that were, uh, were willing to be handed over for Israel, really only in exchange for one thing, that they would recognize the state of Israel. And they won't do it, which tells me that this whole aim is to just eradicate Israel from the uh, globe. And I'm sure you have a little bit to comment on that. Sure. No, no, I do. So on, on a macro level, uh, this vote, of uh, you know, it, it defeated by two votes uh, four years ago and lost by eight votes, shows you that it, it is not an overwhelming majority that, uh, that agree with this. Um, on the macro level, uh, we have to call it for what it is. This is, this is anti-Israel hatred and just blatant anti-Semitism, which is on the rise most definitely in Europe, but uh, all over the place. And then at a, at a micro level, I will tell you that the, the churches that we have relationships with here in southeastern Michigan were devastated. They were devastated that um, years of interfaith bridge building and brotherhood and sisterhood would be destroyed now that um, their um, overall uh, movement has made this decision away from peace, away from families, and in their, in their own words, uh, an ungodlike uh, decision. And so um, we, of course, are going to uh, try to sustain some of that uh, local relationship building, but I will tell you that uh, the Presbyterian USA has driven an enormous wedge between the national Jewish organizations and in Israel, and um, it knew it knew what it was going to do because when they passed, they made special announcement that this was not to, you know, hurt any of their Jewish brothers and sisters. But quite frankly, 
Uh, the fact is that they are made a symbolic gesture to divest from three American companies that don't sell directly to Israel at all, um, affects American workers, American Christian workers, and Presbyterian workers, and um, they, they hurt themselves. And uh, quite frankly, the bulldozers are used can be used for positive or negative, but there's lots of building and construction going on in Israel, in Gaza, in the West Bank, and you need construction materials in order to do that. And so um, these, uh, the facts just got all tangled up. It was a very frustrating time. We had many, I do want to call out many partner seminaries, the Union Seminary, the Auburn Seminary, that flew into Detroit as partners with the Jewish community and with the reform movement. Um, Rabbi Rick Jacobs came and spoke and took time out of his day to, to actually make an offer to have the Presbyterian church leadership come and meet with Benjamin Netanyahu, which was rejected. And so very confusing and complex times, and um, I, I would say that the, the Presbyterian uh, USA Church is going to have to you know, live with their um, assignment and by, by not, you know, probably their own claim because they actually said they're not part of the BDS movement. Every article you pick up and every, uh, the reputation that they have now is that they're associated with the BDS movement. Well, I think what's very important to understand here is that we live in a world of mass communications. It was much easier 100 or 1,000 years ago for one society to have a completely false view of another society and to victimize them or marginalize them because they really had no understanding. And while there may be certain places like North Korea or Iran that could get away with that, that is not the case today, and, and I believe that when decisions like this are made, it absolutely comes from a an innate bias, a decision with where you want to stand, and it does not come from just simply being naive. I, I don't buy that, because I guarantee you that many, many people who are making these decisions, they clearly understand what the lies are. I mean, it, it's hard for me to believe, Howard, that Folks here don't understand, for example, after 9-11, was it the Israelis, uh, not just Jews, but was it generally the Israelis, Israeli Jews, Arabs, and Christians who were jumping up and down in the street when the towers came down, or was it the Palestinians? When the Palestinians were bombing buses on almost a weekly basis and blowing them up, and then the wall was put in place to stop that, what, how, do you, how do you interpret these things? Because these are, these are issues you can go on and on down the line. Israel has a military might literally to crush and destroy and kill every man, woman, and child in the Palestinian territories if that was their will. They have not done that. They have gone out of their way to great pains to try to avoid causing any outright harm, including going to an extreme of doing these knocker bombs or these ceiling where they literally knock on the ceiling to let people know this building is about to be bombed and they give them a couple of minutes to escape, which usually means the bad guys also have a chance to escape. And when you look at what Israel is facing here, it is facing an enemy who on the surface behind Mahmoud Abbas wearing a suit, the president of, the, of, the, of what I still like to call the PLO because I think it's more apropos and more accurate, they... They still, despite what they may say in the Western press, in their own language to their own people, they still constantly reinforce that Israel doesn't exist, doesn't have a right to exist, does not exist on maps. And I have personally walked into all kinds of bookstores and seen Israel does not exist. Go into almost any of the books written in their language, and when you look on the maps, Israel doesn't exist. So, Howard, does that not speak volumes to you? It, it does, John, and I, I appreciate your commentary. I will tell you that there was a piece of uh, literature that is posted on the Presbyterian USA uh, website. It's called Zionism Unsettled, how a church of God's people could put out this um, misinformation um, about, um, about Israel and share that with its church body for download um, it was put out by a very small voice called the Israel-Palestine uh, Network, which is a very small voice of the church, but growing, and obviously growing because they, they got this vote passed um, with intense uh, lobbying. 
uh, at the convention. And um, to me, I just don't understand um, that people's heads are in the sand um, that a identified terrorist organization such as Hamas has now gone in joint uh, you know, co collaboration with the Fatah movement and with Abbas and that how anyone can continue to do business, that sanctions aren't, le aren't levied immediately, that all funding is stopped, is beyond me. I'm just, uh, I'm just shocked at, at, at this, that, the, that there isn't an outcry in the entire world that, uh, that we can even be, uh, have Israel expected to, to negotiate peace with a terrorist organization, but not only for anyone else to do business with them. I think it's just, uh, one, ironic and uh, moronic. Well, well, Israel obviously is the historic and has always and continuously been the homeland of the Jewish people and has always had a strong Jewish presence, even while the majority of the Jews were living in the diaspora spread around the world, uh, mostly because of extreme anti-Semitism and threats to their life uh, and, and liberty that, that they had to leave. But they always maintained a presence there. But the modern nation state of Israel is in fact a manifestation of extreme anti-Semitism. And, and I think it's very important. This is why organizations like the AJC exist, but maybe even more importantly, it's why organizations like the AJC are necessary because this type of anti-Semitism, and I can't call it anything but, because I, it, this goes back to the criticisms I'll often take of certain uh, presidential or other congressional policies, is people in leadership roles like this are not stupid. As a general rule, you have to say they're not stupid. So if they are doing these things, they are doing these things because of their innate biases or because of their goals. And, and it could be that, you know, remember, sometimes evil happens not because somebody actually believes it, but because they think it's somehow in their business interest. And, and I'll tell you what, Howard, what I would like to see, if they really want to boycott Israel, I would like to see them boycott Israel in an appropriate way, Boycott all the technologies that have emanated in Israel. I'd like to see the Presbyterians all put down their cell phones. Stop using them uh, because much of that technology was invented in Israel. Stop using many of the medical technologies that were invented in Israel. It may cost your life, but heck, it was invented in Israel. It was invented by those, the, by those evil apartheid Jews. Put it all down. Stop using it. If you want to actually vote properly, then go ahead and put your money where your mouth is. But you know they won't do that. Yeah, you're right. I do want to offer the slimmest bit of hope is that one of the last things that the moderator called from the floor, and I don't remember where this commissioner, uh, which president he represented, but he stood up very boldly and had nothing to do with the actual vote itself. But he said one of the things that they hadn't done was pray for the Jewish teenagers that had been kidnapped by Hamas um, to have a have a prayer, and uh, he was acknowledged and said it. So uh, there is a slim hope that people will come to their senses and that people understand, um, you know, what the real truth is. But there are so many people out there that are naive, their head in the sand, or choose to ignore the truth. So, Howard, outside of uh, Yad Vashem on the entry, there is a beautiful garden which is dedicated to, and of course, Yad Vashem is the uh, Israel's uh, Holocaust Museum. And there's a garden there dedicated to and named specifically what is referred to in, in a very spiritual way as righteous Gentiles, meaning Christians almost entirely in Europe, many of whom did not survive. Uh, many of whom, like, like Schindler's List, of course, was the most noteworthy example, but many of these people who risked everything and in, and in many cases ended up losing their lives because they stood on the side of right. So I have, the question I have for you is twofold, Howard. One, what difference is there between the Presbyterian movement in the U.S. versus international regarding BDS? And number two, in the light of still always looking for hope, I mean, Brett and I are very, uh, you know, we're kind of hard-edged pragmatists. We call it like we see it. But we're also fathers and, and, and brothers and humans, and we would love to see the world continue to improve. Are there righteous Gentiles in the mix, and how can we work with uh, them both 
uh, on the home front and also internationally on this cause. And I'm speaking specifically within the Presbyterian Church. So the, the, the Presbyterian Church does, um, and I'm not an expert in the Presbyterian Church, but a, a long history of community service and brotherhood and, uh, and missionary work, bringing uh, you know, food, shelter, uh, education, um, as, as well as religious materials and, and conversion materials to uh, strengthen and, and grow their uh, denomination. But um, that is the majority of the work of the Presbyterian Church and not actually the small minority, but ever growing loud and um, impactful voice of um, this uh, Israel-Palestine movement and the BDS movement. Um, they are certainly have a uh, mission and presence in uh, the uh, in, in the, in the uh, Gaza and the West Bank, and they are trying to teach students there. But I, I think I read a quote by President Netanyahu is that if they want to come over here and see what's going on, they better not identify as Christians and they better take an armored bus um, because, uh, quite frankly, uh, Christians are being persecuted uh, in uh, different uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, Iraq and Iran and, uh, and in Syria right now. So, um, there's a little hyperbole going on there, and uh, it's uh, the world's uh, at, at a very, very crisis time. I'm glad you bring that up because if you wanted to bring up the true issue that is happening in the Middle East that's an enormous crime and gets far too little play in the press is that exact thing. Christianity is under attack, arguably even more so than Judaism within the Middle East uh, countries, with the exception of Israel. And ironically, that includes in the Palestinian territories. Christians, obviously, in their own holy lands are feeling so uncomfortable, most of these within the uh, what would be referred to uh, by the other side as the occupied territories, because they don't feel safe. They are moving. In areas like Bethlehem, that used to have 30 or 35 percent of uh, Christian population in very recent history, now are down to 5 or 6 percent. You know, that is... is uh, it's really a crime, and, and it's, uh, it's quite sad. Howard, a specific question regarding the meetings you attended last week. In those discussions, did you hear words being used, for example, were there discussions of, of terrorism, were there discussions of historical borders, were there discussions of the uh, uh, Palestinians lack of acceptance of Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. Did they get into these political issues much at all? So, uh, un unfortunately, in the committee, um, they did. Um, we had uh, one of the assistant moderators uh, preach at a, uh, t to the entire committee that, you know, Jesus was bold enough to uh, tell the Jews when they were wrong, which was completely out of place. Um, there was a vote that was defeated very soundly on whether to support a one-state solution that should have never been on the docket in the first place. Um, I would say that it's, uh, it became increasingly frustrating um, because the, one of the first days they allow you 90 seconds to advocate for, and then they give just the equal number to advocate against. And they basically uh, all cancel each other out, and it makes for the commissioners a very, very uh, confusing uh, swing and pendulum swing back and forth. I will say that, um, surprisingly or not, an objective were the older commissioners. I will tell you that the younger generation is misinformed and was heavily, heavily sided with the BDS movement. Much to my chagrin. Yeah, that, that's rather unfortunate. And... Uh... Hopefully that changes soon. I just want to uh, bring up a few details here that are, you know, in my opinion, significant. One is there are many organizations and uh, of all types that are following this particular issue, and I just want to read from a friend of ours, uh, Frank Gaffney, who's with the Center for Security Policy, who put out a little press release on this issue. So last week, the Presbyterian Church USA's biannual General Assembly meeting considered two resolutions aiming at delegitimating and otherwise harming Israel. The assembly actually narrowly approved one resolution calling for divestment by the church of three companies which uh, were held in its portfolios. The reason they do business with the Jewish state. Another re resolution was even more problematic had it not been rejected. 
Presbyterians would have agreed that God's biblical blessings of the Jewish people applied only to their ancient state and not to the modern one. Uh, those hostile to Israel will continue trying to turn Presbyterians and others against her. We must stand with Israel. That means neither Americans of faith nor our government should, by resolutions, funding, or similar acts of Islamist appeasement, engage in measures that would isolate and perhaps ultimately destroy her. And so, of course, we know we have a friend in Frank Gaffney and a friend in the security, I'm sorry, Center for Security Policy, but I also want to bring up one other thing here, and I think this is a tremendous act by the following group of members of Congress in, uh, in the House of Representatives, and this is the uh, House Resolution Number 622. It's about eight pages long and very well written and very um, in-depth, and I, I recommend this for anyone who's listening to check this one out, and we'll, of course we'll post it on our Facebook page. But in the House of Representatives on June 12, 2014, uh, Mr. Frank of Arizona, Ms. Ms. Bachman, Mr. Lamborn, Mr. Johnson of Ohio, Mr. King of Iowa, Mr. Collins of Georgia, Mr. Rowe of Tennessee, Mr. Lada, Mr. Stockman, Mr. Pittenger, Mr. Posey, Mr. Barton, Mr. Nagabauer, Mr. Pitts, Mr. Gomert, Mr. Barr, and Mr. Weber of Texas submitted the following resolution, which was to be referred to the Committee on Foreign Affairs. And this all has to do with expressing a sense of the House of Representatives regarding the national security interests of the United States and its allies and partners with respect to the Palestinian Authority, where essentially they are calling for the complete um, cease and desist of funding and support of the PL, uh, Palestinian Authority, uh, PLA, or whatever you, whichever organization or group of terrorists you want to refer to, but essentially saying that they are now um, a terrorist organization because of their actions uh, completely because they've joined forces and the fact that and they give a whole long list of things the violations and the different things which have been tried over the years, which have, which they have not agreed to, and they really just feel like this is the only way to support and move peace forward is to say, your actions have to, have to change. And the only way it's going to change is if we cut off the funding. Because if we continue, and I, I believe the number, John, was $5 billion. Yes, $5 billion. Since the Oslo Accords in 1993, that the United States is committed to the PA. And I'm sure many of those dollars have funded the rockets which continue to land on a daily basis in Israel. So, Howard, I want to bring up those couple things, and uh, we'll, we'll make that the last uh, part of our uh, discussion for today. Well, I certainly appreciate it. Um, keep up the good work, and uh, appreciate you having me on today. And uh, no doubt this is uh, a, a complex time but uh, no, day, no, no doubt that we need to uh, strengthen our efforts and, uh, and keep both the advocacy and education and, uh, and support. And, uh, again, I look forward to coming on at a, at a later date, and uh, thanks for uh, having me on today. Uh, great. And, Howard, uh, what is the AJC's website so uh, people can check them out? AJC.org, and uh, you can follow them on Facebook and Twitter. And um, great information uh, about advocacy and all the major uh, issues that uh, that face Jews around the world in Israel. Great. Howard Brown, thank you so much. We'll look forward thank to you. speaking to you again soon.